Right. Thanks, everyone. Please come take a seat. Take your time. We're good. Um, so, yeah, thanks all for joining me today. I am here to talk to you about systems. And that's probably a word that you have heard before. And the thing about systems is that they are all around us. So, like, you are a system, I am a system, our bodies are systems, you know, each cell is a system. And dev organizations are systems, teams are systems. So, once we understand how systems work and how they're around us and why they behave the way that they do, which is often not what you would like them to do, um, that's when we can start really um, implementing long-term change because the, um, the crux of system, or the, the core of systems thinking is really understanding relationships between individual things. So by the end of this talk, hopefully, you will leave with a new understanding of um, like new language, new toolkits, and a new understanding of um, these very big problems that can spend multiple teams or organizations or even generations in some cases. So a little bit of info about myself. Um, my name is Lian, developer advocate at Loft Labs. Um, I am uh, the tech lead since August, uh, the technical lead for the CNCF's technical advisory group for cloud native app delivery, which is a bit of a mouthful. And I'm the chief karaoke officer at Kuberoki, which is the first and only Kubernetes karaoke community. Um, we are going tonight, karaoke's tonight, uh, at Colibri Club. I think we're going to, I don't know, 9, 10 or something. So um, feel free to join us. Uh, you can also follow Kuberoki on Twitter or Xvixer or whatever it's called nowadays. <laughs> So if you want to also get in touch with me and talk about this or other topics later, you can find me on the uh, app that used to be a bird, uh, Lian Makes Things. You can go to the app that's still an elephant, uh, Lian Makes Things at hackydurum.io, and the, the app that no one's on, uh, which is Blue Sky. Um, you can also, if you want to be professional, send me an email uh, or go to LinkedIn. Uh, I'm fairly active there now, now that X is dead. Uh, so, yeah, that's how you can contact me or talk to me outside. I know we're already started. I don't know what they're calling us. So before we start, just a quick word from my sponsors. Um, yeah, my company, Loft Labs, as I said, and we provide... Um, building blocks for platform engineers. But a lot of our, what we do is based on uh, open source. So as a DevRel, I am mainly um, managing our open source community liaisons. And uh, maybe you've heard of any of these three tools. They're DevPod, vCluster, and DevSpace, all around developer tooling for um, cloud-native development. So Kubernetes, but not only. So my talk is not about any of these, so you can um, come to me later if you want to chat. All right, so um, let's start this talk with a story. Stories are very powerful, and I want to tell you the story of the ship of Theseus. So Theseus um, was the mythical Greek founder king of Athens, and he saved the children of Athens from the Minotaur. Um, so he defeated the, um, the Minotaur, saved the Athenians, and as a thank you to that, the Athenians would take out his ship every year on a pilgrimage to celebrate, you know, their savior. And they would do this every year, and obviously after a while, ship gets broken, you need to exchange individual elements of the ship. So the ancient philosophers of the time were posing this question, if we switch out every single thing of the ship, every wooden plank, every sail, every rope, is it still Theseus' ship? So this is a question that can, there's no real answer here. In systems thinking, what we say is that for a system to be a system, it needs to have elements. So wooden planks, sails, ropes, nails, glue, whatever. All of these are elements, and these elements need to be interconnected in some way. So they need to be nailed together or something, or like glued together. And then finally, um, the whole thing needs to have some kind of function. So in this case, it would be taking people from one place to the other over water. And in systems thinking, what we're saying is that once 
the interconnections and the function, as long as they are the same, you can switch out all the elements and it's still gonna be the same system. So yes, if you ask a systems thinker, yes, this is still a thesis, a ship even after hundreds of years. Now, if you change the interconnections, so you leave the elements, you leave the function, you change the interconnections. As an example, you are building a raft. So you're taking the ship apart, you're building a raft. Still have the exact same elements, still have the same function, but it's not the same system anymore because the interconnections have changed. Then a couple hundred years ago, uh, there were some religious Puritans who left the UK to go to sail to the West. And um, once they arrived, they would take their ships and flip them over and make churches out of them. So we have the same elements, we have the same interconnections, but the function of the system has completely changed, which means the system has profoundly changed as well. It's not a ship anymore, it's a church now. Um, so, the function of a system is sometimes the least obvious one, but it's the most important for a system to be the way that it is. Another thing to, important thing to know about systems is that systems can contain subsystems. As I said before, if our cells are systems, our bodies are systems, we as a whole, you know, consisting of body and brain are also a system, blah, 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 blah. And um, you can look at, at systems um, the boundary of a system depends on the problem that you're looking at. So I could take away some elements of a system and just look at this other part of it, and that's still okay. There's no right or wrong here. It really just depends on what are you focusing on, what's the problem you're trying to understand and solve. So let's talk a little bit about the types of elements of a system. So one type is a stock. And a stock is anything that you can see or feel or count or measure at any time. So they would represent the store or the quantity or the accumulation of material or information over time. So it doesn't have to be anything physical. A stock could also be patience or happiness. And, uh, yeah, I said, it's not necessarily physical. So another type of elements are flows. Um, flows have inherent interconnections to stocks. They are always connected to a stock. And um, pretty straightforward, inflows make a stock grow and outflows make a stock shrink. And if the inflow and outflow are about the same, then you will eventually reach some kind of equilibrium. The stock in between the in and out flow can act as a buffer or a delay, which has a bunch of advantages because now they're independent from each other. So if the inflow changes, the outflow doesn't necessarily need to also change. There's something in between, which means that if we see something change, we do have a little bit of time to maneuver and you know, change stuff without that uh, first change to affect all the other parts of the system. But it also can have negative consequences because we don't immediately see the, um, the results of our actions, the connections between in and outflow. And I will, I will explain all that a little bit more in detail. Um, finally, the function. Um, so I've so far used the word function. I might sometimes use the word purpose. The difference is that a purpose is something that's inherently human. Humans have purpose. And humans design systems with a purpose. However, the function of, a of the system is just what it does. It doesn't necessarily overlap with your purpose. And that's exactly what happens a lot of time. We design a, a system with a specific purpose, but then it turns out the system that we designed has a different function now. Often the first function of any system is to ensure its own survival, uh, its own perpetuation. And again, we'll get to it a little bit more uh, down the road. Uh, then there's another thing, which is something that's not necessary for a system, but it's something that tends to emerge from system, which is behavior. And behavior is something that persists over time, completely regardless of in and out flows, because there's a mechanism that creates the specific behavior. And we call these mechanisms feedback loops. So typically in systems, you will have multiple feedback loops and some will dominate others. And if a system's behavior changes, that's usually when the dominance of one loop changes. So one loop suddenly becomes more dominant over another loop and that's when the behavior changes of the system. 
not all systems have feedback loops, and just because you have a feedback loop doesn't mean that the system works really well. Because again, it can be unintentional. It can just be, happens to be the function of the system even though you didn't intend it to. Okay, let's look at one simple example of a system. So here we have a stock, which is the room temperature. And it's cold outside. I, I don't know if you still remember when it was cold outside, but let's say it's cold outside, it's winter, and um, over time, hot air might leave the room or cold air will enter the room. That is our outflow of the room temperature. Now, we have a radiator that can heat the air, so now we have something that will create an inflow to the room temperature stock. And the function of our system is to keep the room at a toasty 20 degrees Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit if you're from across the pond. Now, what we're doing, usually probably, is we're monitoring the room temperature, and if there's a discrepancy between the actual room temperature and our desired room temperature, then we will jump into action, and we will turn on the radiator maybe, or we close the window. And um, you can do this as a human being, or you can have like an automated system that does it. As I said, you can change the elements of a system, and it's still the same system. And uh, so any kind of feedback loop, so this, uh, these two um, arrows would represent a feedback loop. Any kind of feedback loop is triggered by a change in a stock, and it affects the in and outflows of that same stock. So this feedback loop specifically is trying to stabilize a stock, and therefore it's called a balancing feedback loop. Balancing feedback loops are stabilizing or goal-seeking, and eventually they will reach an equilibrium. So, but as you can see in this graph, it might never just go you know, perfectly on that line, but it might just oscillate around that, which is probably the case with room temperature. You will never like, hit exactly what you want. Okay, let's take another look at, the, uh, at another example. So here we have a stock, which is the number of rabbits living in a space, which might be, let's say, your backyard. And um, over time, uh, the population grows when rabbits are born, and the population shrinks when rabbits leave. So the function of the system is pretty straightforward because it's just to survive and thrive, to ensure its own survival, to procreate, to adapt. And if we don't do anything, over time, our rabbits will do what rabbits do. They will birth more rabbits that will become mature, which will birth even more rabbits that can procreate, and so on and so forth. And uh, our population will probably explode at some point. So this is called a reinforcing feedback loop. Um, or a runaway feedback loop, because it amplifies and it self-multiplies. So what often happens is that it might snowball, because it, if it's uncontrolled. This type of growth is not linear, it's exponential. And if we don't keep this in check, it will almost always lead to an eventual collapse of the system, because exponential growth like this is just not sustainable. <clears throat> Capitalism. Um, so yeah. Uh, are you following me so far? Is that like, okay, good, we're feeling it. So one of the things why I really like systems thinking is because it is kind of intuitive. Like, even if we don't have the language, we do tend to understand what's going on. And that's because of the system archetypes, or sometimes they're called system storylines or system traps. Um, and these archetypes are um, common structures, common patterns of problematic behavior. Uh, so the, in this next section, I will look at three different archetypes, and we will learn how we can draw a systems map, and then make inferences from that map to discuss how we can get out of these traps. So the first archetype is called fixes that fail or fixes that backfire. And I'm going to tell a story again, um, which is about the 1967 Romanian communist government. Do, are there any Romanians here? Oh, do you remember 1967? Not that, not that well, okay. So uh, 67, the government issued Decree 770, which effectively outlawed abortion and contraception because they had a declining birth rate and they were trying to combat that. And as, an, um, as a result of this de decree directly, the year after the, um, the birth rate, I think, doubled. Yeah, almost doubled between 66 and 67. 
But it had devastating consequences to the community by the time these babies grew up to become children because there was not enough food, there was not enough shelter, there was not enough education. So for some reason, they forgot that uh, babies become children eventually. So starting in the 70s, the birth rates declined again. So because family were just, families were just not able to meet the economic pressure of raising these many children without the support from the government. And people began to seek ways to circumvent the decree, which meant that richer women uh, would be able to you know, go abroad and um, uh, obtain contraceptives or abortions Ill illegally, while the poorer women would just put themselves at incredible risks um, to get rid of unwanted pregnancies, which meant that the mortality among pregnant women and infants skyrocketed. Um, Compared to other um, communists, also like communist countries in the area, um, mortality rates were almost tenfold. That's pretty, pretty bad. So what happened at this, uh, that caused this archetype? So here we're drawing a systems map now. So we're starting with a problem symptom, and that's our stock. So this, this num number of symptoms, if you so want, or how bad the symptoms are, that's our stock. And in, if we encounter this archetype, usually we don't understand the problem well enough or we're just fixating on the symptom but not the actual problem. So what we're doing is we will implement a solution that only works in the short run. And um, the more problem symptoms we encounter, the more solutions we will implement. So that's why there's an arrow with a plus because that ex basically means that an increase in this one stock has as a okay, this doesn't work, uh, as a direct consequence, will grow this other stock. So basically, this is an inflow. Now, the more solutions that we implement, the less we problem symptoms we have. They might just work on the short run, but they do work. So here, this is a minus, because the more of this stock we have, the less we have of this stock as a direct uh, consequence. The general rule is if you have a loop and you have an uneven number of these minuses, that is a balancing feedback loop. So this will balance itself out over time. Now the thing is, we didn't actually solve the problem. We just solved, if anything, the symptom of the problem. So what we're doing is we're introducing unintended consequences. Again, the more solutions we implement, the more uh, unintended consequences we introduce with a slight delay, which is what these two lines through the arrow mean. And as I mentioned before, delays can be good because they can act as stuff, uh, stock buffers. But in this case, it's very problematic because they somewhat have separated now the action from the result. We might not even understand that the consequences are a result of our uh, solutions. So now, the more unintended consequences we have introduced, the worse our problem symptoms are getting again. So if we are looking at this outer loop, and again, I can just ignore the, the, the uh, arrow in between because I don't have to look at that system. Now I'm looking at the outer loop system. So here what we see is that we have a even number of minuses, zero, it's an even number, and that is a reinforcing feedback loop, which means that if we look at just this loop, we see that this is actually getting worse and worse and worse over time. There's also a very specific case of the fixes that backfire, which are called policy resistance. And, um, what, what that means is just that the underlying problem on the left might be its own subsystem. It just has to do with some people trying to improve it or trying to move the stock in one direction and other people trying to move the stock in another direction just because they have detrimental goals. So in a development organization, that is an example that I've seen quite a lot, is that leadership wants to pivot. They want to now, maybe someone went to a conference and then they come back and like, oh, we have to use Kubernetes now, or we have to build platforms now, or something like that. Because they think that will make the developers more efficient. But they didn't even look at the actual underlying problem, which might be that developers just don't have enough Slack time to do R&D, or simply they don't feel empowered to make decisions about their own work environment. So instead of addressing that, the, it's just, okay, we're just pivoting to another technology, and people will, will resist that. 
And that might be the underlying problem over here on the left. So how can we get out of this archetype? Break that connection between the problem symptom and the short-term solution. So basically, break the connection that starts this whole cycle. Just let go of the short-term short -term fix. Bring in all the actors of the system and try to seek out a compromise so all the actors' goals can be realized, or you can also redefine a larger shared goal and then find out what every actor needs to um, pull toward that goal. So that is an example. In the 1930s, Sweden also saw that their birth rates were declining. And uh, the Swedish government uh, brought all the stakeholders together and then agreed on one goal, which was that no child should be in material need and every child should have access to education and healthcare. So the resulting policies that they enacted seemed kind of counterintuitive at first because they were providing contraceptives and abortions because they wanted every child to be wanted. Um, improved widespread sex education, made divorces easier, uh, provided free obstetrical care, supports for family in, families in need, greatly increased investment in education and healthcare. Since then, the birth rate has risen and dropped again. I believe it's currently dropping again. But the point is that the Swedish government just decided our goal is not the particular number of Swedes in the world, but we want to make sure that we have this transcendent goal that we all share, which means which is about happiness, which is about making sure that the people who are born are productive and can live their fullest potential. So a similar archetype, which is, this is the second one, uh, to the fixes that fail is shifting the burden. And it's a very simple example for this, because it's also sometimes called addiction. There are some people in the world who um, like coffee to the point that they will tell you, oh, I'm not even awake until I had my first coffee. So instead of sleeping eight hours a night, they just drink coffee. And that's what shifting the burden basically is. So we start with a problem symptom, and we know that we could put some time and effort into finding like a long-term solution, but it takes time for that long-term solution to take hold. So while this would be balancing each other out eventually, instead, we are now introducing a short-term solution that gives us the instant gratification and you know, success. And as we already learned, that's probably not a good idea because we're introducing some side effects. So now we have a problem. We're making, uh, we're implementing short-term solutions. We, uh, we introduce these side effects. N the difference here is now that now, over time, this system will rely more and more on the short-term solution to keep running and not let the problem escalate. And the more we do that, actually, the side effects will make the long-term solutions less feasible over time. So as an example, if you are addicted to caffeine, for example, even sleeping eight hours a day won't, won't give you, you know, the rest that you need unless you really break that habit. So here we have these two problem-fixing loops, and one of them is just more popular than the other. But when you keep in mind that we can look at this loop, which includes the side effects. So now we're looking at problem symptom, short-term solution, increasing side effects, which reduces the long-term um, long solutions feasibility, um, which then, so you have to flip that around in your head because now we're looking at more long-term solutions make the problem symptoms worse. So if we have less some long-term solutions, oh, sorry, more long-term solutions make the problem symptom better. So if we have less long-term solutions, it makes the problem symptoms worse. In a systems map, it, the arrows always, like the starting point of the arrow is always an increase in that stock and what's the consequences of an increase. So sometimes you have to flip it around in your head. So if we just look at this red one, we can see, again, we have two minuses, so we have a reinforcing feedback loop here. So we call this archetype shifting the burden because we're not addressing, again, the actual problem to keep the system alive and running, but instead we're relying on this short-term solution. And even worse, the system becomes addicted to the short-term solution as the mounting side effects just make the long-term solution less and less feasible. So I used to be a consultant, and um, where I've encountered the situation was 
a lot of times I would go into really big organizations and they were so completely dependent on external consultants, not just to innovate and build new stuff, but just to keep their own systems running. They just didn't have the manpower or the um, capabilities to run their own um, products. So the more, um, the more you do this, the more external consultants you, you, you uh, invite to do that, the less this is what happened, um, your own engineers are capable of doing that themselves. They become more and more complacent. So how do we get out? Again, we want to break the connection that kicks off this vicious cycle, which is between the problem symptom and the short-term solution. So reduce dependence on that quick fix and increase investment into the fundamental solution. You can do that by getting everyone together and creating a vision of an alternate future. And that will compel the investment uh, over the long term. If it's necessary to introduce a quick fix, make sure that when you do that, it's a, you're building towards the actual solution instead of undermining it. So I'm going back to the consultancy example where um, we were contracted to build a CI/CD platform, but some engineers just didn't feel comfortable deploying microservices independently of each other. They just didn't, never did that before. Um, but also partly because they didn't build microservices, they built a uh, distributed monolith. But that's another talk. Um, so they were just not familiar with like CISD in practice and sometimes not even deploying themselves. That was also something that was new to them. So what we did was we built a kind of hack that allowed them to bundle up a group of services that they had tested against each other on a staging environment, and they can pin those versions and then basically deploy the whole bundle into production. It's not really CICD, uh, microservice CICD, but you know what? At least what we could do is create some trust in the CICD platform first. And what we did was basically we built this in a way that to the platform itself, it was just a custom variation of what it was doing. So once the team was confident enough to work with this um, platform, we could just basically flip the switch and then switch to proper microservice CICD. Okay. Mm. This is the final archetype. It's the most complicated to draw, but I think it's probably maybe the most straightforward to understand. And I'm going to start again with a story um, that probably you might know, which is about overfishing. It's, it's the same for fracking as well, or like drilling for oil, but overfishing is probably a better um, example. Because it has a long history dating back to pre-industrial times. But since uh, the Industrial Revolution it has really accelerated because of all the advances in fishing um, technology and globalization. And that has led, unfortunately, to the depletion of fish stocks around the world, um, the collapse of fisheries, and um, especially in uh, developing countries, the um, loss of jobs, food insecurity, and other socioeconomic consequences like wars. And what happens is that we start with one actor, actor A, who is doing some activities. I should have mentioned that the archetype is called tragedy of the commons. Um, the more activity A does, the more A gains. So this is a simple reinforcing feedback loop. The more I do, the more I get. And since we are, this is about shared resources, Actors A's, actor A's activities uh, become part of all the shared activities. And the bigger the total activity over time, again with a delay, the less everyone gains per individual activity. And that's because there is a resource limit. So the resource limit will increase the gain per individual activity uh, so that over time, there's only so much you can do, basically, right? Even, even if you put much more effort into it, you're not going to get that much of a yield anymore. So your ROI is getting smaller and smaller. And the less is gained per individual activity, the less actor A gains. So again, you have to flip it around in your head. The less this is, the, the less that other thing is as well. So 
this is, in fact, if you just look at that, that's a balancing feedback loop. There's an upper limit, and the system will self-regulate as the gain per individual activity just goes to zero at some point. And um, because this is a shared resource, we have the same thing for actor B, actor C, infinite amount of actors could be imaginable here. So this archetype illustrates what happens when multiple actors exploit a shared resource, because the, this feedback that gets back to actor A about, hey, if you keep doing this, you're not going to get that much out of it, by the way, it's delayed. So by the time it arrives, things are actually way worse than they may seem. Or we have maybe crossed the threshold where things could still be salvaged. There's only, like, there's a minimum number of fish that you can have in a sea. If, if, if you have less than them, they're just going to die. They're not going to procreate anymore. So while this delay is happening, that reinforcing feedback loop still keeps each actor cranking out more and more activity, which makes the whole thing even worse, right? So how can we get out of this? Uh, as with this and all the other archetypes I ta talked about, education is a very important factor as well. So if you show them like something like this, um, each actor might understand the consequences of abusing the resource. You can also restore or strengthen this missing feedback link, either by privatizing the commons, so each user feels the direct consequences of its abuse, or regulating the commons by regulating access to the resource. So, uh, for example, our commercial product does exactly that. When you have a bunch of developers who share a Kubernetes cluster, and they just keep spinning up pods willy-nilly, you could just give them each their own cluster and have them deal with resource management themselves. That's what we do with vCluster. vCluster are virtual clusters, and you can have your own virtual cluster, but it's still, um, it, it, it can still be regulated in some way. So the other thing that you can do is to build a platform on top of the shared cluster so each team only has limited access to the resources. So that would be regulating the commons. Um, yeah, so that was, were the three archetypes. And in this last section, for which I have four minutes, three minutes, I just quickly want to go through some uh, just notes uh, to think about how you can use systems thinking now to, in, to think and work with the systems. And I'm using platform engineering as an example because this is something that we're all kind of talking about and uh, it's also something that I personally work with a lot. Um, also, s platforms are a really good way to understand, to basically look at the problems that we've set out to solve with DevOps and solve them in a systemic way instead of trying to just uh, optimize every single thing. Okay, I need to go really quick because there's a lot of this. Okay, so most people, when you tell them a problem, they will come with a solution immediately. What you need to do as a systems thinker is really inquire before you advocate. Try to understand what it is, why things are the way that they are, and let them know that you know their needs are valid. And if you're a platform engineer, your platform is there to help them, not the other way around. So always inquire before advocating. Next, try to get at the mental models that cause these cause-effect relationships that we talked about that we need to break out. What are beliefs that people hold? Obviously, respect them before you question them. But, you know, some people will believe Kubernetes will solve all my problems or this specific tool, that specific tool. So bring those to the light of day. When you try to solve a problem systematically, you should not try to optimize each element of the system. You shouldn't think of, oh, this is the perfect IDE, so everyone now needs to use this IDE. But rather increase the relationships between elements. How can you empower each engineer to make the best decisions for their own work environment? Understanding buffers and delays and utilizing them correctly is super powerful. If you start thinking in systems, you start identifying stocks, like compute resources, like cognitive load, and you can notice maybe wild oscillations or extreme states of stocks. You know, like an engineer just can't do anything anymore because he holds so much cognitive load. Then you can try to intervene by changing in and outflows maybe, or you could introduce a feedback loop. Because as we've learned, feedback loops are how systems behave. So make use of them, try to understand them, build in feedback policies into your system so it's able to self-regulate and self-heal and balance each other, uh, balance itself out. 
Take a view of responsibility. That might be one of the, uh, this is probably the most important one. When people look at a problem systemically and they see how their own behavior contributes to the problem, even if they don't intend to, they will take responsibility for the issue. You know, like, taking responsibility is not about blaming yourself. It's about seeing that if I'm part of the problem, by definition, I can be part of the solution. And that can be so empowering for a lot of people. And they will see how, you know, I affect you and you affect me, and they might self-limit. They might come up with um, policies themselves because they, now they're seeing how they are interfering with each other. All right, really quickly, I have two books I recommend on systems thinking. Thinking in systems, it's a great book to get started. Um, okay, we're done. Uh, and the other one is called Systems Thinking for Social Change. Ah, oh, we're back. Oh, would it? okay. Um, so yeah, these two books are great. I will tell you what they are after the talk as well. And I do have two more slides that I'm not going to. Okay. So what, the other things I wanted to tell you is that there's a meetup online on Thursday about our tools, which I would invite you to join. And there is DevOps Days in Eindhoven, October 11th and 12th, which I would also invite you to join. And if you talk to me or Floor, then you might even get a ticket discount for that. So that's it. I don't think I have time for questions. You can catch me outside. Thank you. Give it up for Eliane.